welcome everybody. I think David uh, did a great job in setting some context and um, I'm just gonna take the session a bit forward. So just to start, right? I'm sure all of you have received some pop-ups or some ads on your cell phone today morning or just now, which is about something uh, which you like or would you want to buy? So what is all that, right? So yeah, so I'm not gonna give away too much because that's what is in store for the session, but let me give you a sneak peek that this is all about media. And today we're gonna to talk about media science and how Dunham B is pioneering in the field of media science from specifically focused on measurement to optimization. So quite an exciting and packed session today. So I'm sure all of you are ready. So I think before getting uh, deeper into the session, I'll just quickly like to introduce you to who we are and what we do. So Dunham B is a global leader in data science and we work across 70 plus or 78 retail clients and 1250 plus CPGs across the globe. Uh, we work with clients across different geographies from North America, Europe, uh, LATAM and across the globe everywhere, right? We work with bigger retailers like Tesco, uh, Meyer, Rayleigh's, Coop and a number of them. And this is what makes us a global leader. We've been working with all our clients to make sure that we put customers at the heart of every decision that they make using our customer data science expertise. And really we work with clients to use their data assets in the most optimized way and accelerate how they drive their business by integrating the data science into their system and simplifying everything they know want, want to know about the customer, right? So that's what Dunhambi does and we really do it well. So, let me give you a brief uh, view of the kind of data and the kind of uh, scale at which Dunham B operates. And that's what really is our strength. We work with nearly 61 billion uh, unique personalized offers, uh, you know, processing almost 18 billion uh, records um, every week to like 586 million plus baskets and touching almost 770 million plus customers. So that's the scale at which we touch customers across the globe. And this combined with our expertise of over 32 years of knowledge and our brilliant data scientists sitting across the globe really makes our strength. And this is what Dunhambi really, uh, you know, makes Dunhambi the more special organization to help our retailers and suppliers put data science to what they do every day. So let me give you a little bit more on the different kinds of capabilities and consultancies that uh, Dunham B does, right? So we start with almost data consultancy, right? Helping clients utilize their data assets in the right way so that we can create a more uh, trusted data assets for our client. And that's where our capabilities sit on top of it. Our capabilities range from customer knowledge, which is about understanding your customers. What do they want? How do they like? How much do they engage with you? To then using that to reach your customers and engage them to the right kind of loyalty programs, building personalized offers, and a lot more, right? And then there is the other side, right? Which is more about helping our clients really uh, set up the whole category space well, you know, display or uh, product shelf space, and also driving a lot more in the pricing and promotion space, which is about the kind of offers uh, you know, customers should get. What is the kind of prices should they offer? And, and this is just a, a, a small summary, right? There is a lot more that we do in all of these capabilities. And then the last and the most fascinating and the exciting uh, kid on the block is the Dalhambi Media, which, is, which has been our strength. And I think we've gotten into the field of retail media now, which is, which is something which is picking up really well, right? And that is what you're gonna hear today uh, more about the work that we do, right? It is about really providing the customer a connected experience, right? With the world changing into a more digital platform, it's kind of picking up really well. And this is where, you know, the expertise that Dunham holds uh, over the years comes into play. And we've been working with bigger retailers and CPGs across the globe to make sure that we're able to put our science to do the media uh, targeting and measurement quite right. So yeah, so now this gives you a sneak peek of what Dunham is, right? And what do we really do? So let's, without, you know, much delay, get into what the session today holds, right? So we will start with a quick introduction of what retail media is and you know how do we really uh, work on it and then we'll get into a couple of very exciting pieces that the team has been working on we'll start with the budget allocation piece uh, using linear optimization and then we'll end with the market mix modeling piece so yeah so that's that's really from me and i'm really excited for the session ahead so um i think i will hand it over to rajat now uh, to start with the next session on introduction to retail media rajat Thanks, Shweta. 
um, sharing my screen. Just let me know once you're able to see it. Yeah, am I audible, Shweta? And is my screen visible? That looks perfect, Rajat. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks, David. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, based on whatever time zones you are participating from. I am Rajat, and joining me, we have Arya, Ankit, and Amit. And today, we all are extremely happy to take you all through the trip, exploring the world of retail media and help you visualize the art and science behind it. So in terms of agenda, Shweta has already talked about it. I'll be briefly you know, uh, covering it. So we have divided today's presentation in three key sections. Uh, we'll start by setting up the premise for the fundamentals of the retail media, the what, the why, and the how aspect of it. We will then move towards the art of media budget optimization. And finally, we'll explore the science to tackle the growing complexity of modern marketing. So without further ado, let's tighten our seat belts and join us on this journey to explore the world of retail media for the next 50, 55 minutes. But before we jump to understand the retail media in particular, it is very important to have an overview of the retail world in general, right? A world which is very similar to the basic essence of an ecosystem existing around us, but different participants playing their own share of role to play, right? So we, we have witnessed it ourselves, right? The fauna dependent on the flora for food and shelter, the flora dependent on the community for water and nurturing, and the community dependent on both flora and fauna for food and rejuvenation, right? So our retail ecosystem also follows some of the same principle, with its different uh, participants working in tandem to attain their respective objectives. One of the key players in this ecosystem are the brands, the suppliers, who bring in their products to the market, and at the same time aims to overcome one of the top performers within a category, right? Well, you know, simultaneously winning with both the retailers and their target audiences alike. Think about the beauty segment and probably, you know, L'Oreal would come to your mind. Think of maybe the food and beverage section and Unilever would click. So these are some of the key examples of the brands that have now become a household name for us. Once when we have the brands established, next comes the retailer, the host that shelters these brands under its wing to cater to the collective needs and requirements of the customers, right? And in the process, of course, tries to win their trust and loyalty and of course, increase its market share in parallel. Some of the common examples being Tesco, Walmart, Waitrose, again, names none of us are un, you know, unfamiliar with. And finally, the last and perhaps the most important participant of this ecosystem are the kings themselves, the customers, right? The, perhaps, you know, uh, the most important participant who actually drives the actions of both the retailers and the suppliers, right? And what is their objective? They simply look forward to the best shopping experience, both in terms of the cost and quality, and more than often appreciates being rewarded by the offers and promotions. However, one thing that lies common across all three players is that urge of attaining the maximum utility out of every resource shared out by them in the process. And that one platform that helps them achieve this equilibrium is exactly what we call the retail media. Now, the concept of the retail media is neither a new concept nor an unknown process to all of us, right? As Shweta mentioned, I think uh, all of us have been a participant in this retail media world in one way or another. But still, if I have to explain it literally, it is the advertising or maybe the marketing that is bought by these brands within and sometimes beyond, uh, you know, the retailer's environment across multiple channels. It could be a digital channel, it could be a physical channel for that matter, and generally involves the use of the retailer data that enables these advertisers to kind of find and reach their right audience for their products. And given the enormous surge in its popularity, demand, and of course, effectiveness, today we sit in a world where we are heavily surrounded by them, right from our couch to the end number of stores out there, right? So just, just imagine you are enjoying your morning coffee and suddenly get an SMS, 10% off on your favorite jar of coffee. Classic example of retail media. You're out with your family for shopping and suddenly maybe an ad pops up in your Facebook page. Buy one, get one free on your favorite apparel. Another great example. You got to a store for your monthly purchases and came across you know, those danglers, magazines or television screens showcasing all those alluring offers out there. All this is an extensive part of the retail media and you know what the best part is that we don't even realize how deeply it is getting a part and parcel of our lifestyle and that perhaps gives us even more reason to understand and of course harness the best out of it 
but do you think the state of retail media you know as broad as we see today was it always the case like this and the answer is a big no the face of the retail media as we see today is very different from how it used to exist long long back right so there was a time in distant past and many of you will relate also you know there was a time when the retailers and the suppliers they used to rely on those cost heavy and traditional media channels like maybe direct mailers or in store advertisements that either used to leave deep cuts on their pockets or were crippled with you know those low reach among the customers so gradually you know mobiles internet and applications they started becoming a household name and there emerged channels like sms email and push notifications you know that has gained tremendous popularity out there and finally today thanks to the digitalization the entire world is a stage for the retail media that attract this target audience right now who would have ever thought that entertainment platforms like facebook youtube and even tiktok for that matter would emerge as a channel for retail media so definitely it would certainly not be an exaggeration if i say that we have came a really long way amidst the evolution of the retail media domain an evolution that perhaps surfaced either due to the changing marketing landscape or to overcome certain challenges for example you know low reach low engagement etc that i already talked about you know but what is life without challenges and that is why you know even our retail ecosystem is not immune to that concept especially after the latest shift in the behavioral pattern of the customers be it because of covid digitalization or the immense competition out there there are so many challenges knocking the door of both the retailers and the suppliers alike right for example you know loyalty of the customers you know one of the most prized possessions of our participants is something that is now under threat and is in in return you know kind of eroding the marketing share of some of the key players who used to dominate the market once upon a time and you know again not an exaggeration if i'll put it this way that it was never ever this challenging uh, you know than today to assess the changing dynamic of the customer preferences so what is the crux here the idea is actually to regain the loyalty by adapting with the fragmented channel landscape and taking the best decisions and at the right time but you know where there are challenges there coexist the opportunities the pace at which the retail media is leaving its mark in the advertising domain is tremendous and there is no denying the fact about it right there are so many research papers so many articles that boast about how retail media is expanding i have just quoted one of the uh, recent warc report that says that how you know the global ad spend under the retail media is expected to be a whopping 122 billion dollars and is not surprising of course that now it is one of the largest meat uh, you know advertising media and has left behind some of the traditional channels like audio cinema and even you know ott streaming etc so definitely without a hint of doubt uh, the opportunities are immense and a lot of it can be attributed to some of the exogenous variables like maybe the increase in digitalization rise of e-commerce and in fact even the impending deprecation of third party cookies a debatable topic we can discuss some other day right that is but ultimately all of them has in a way put a spotlight to the retail media in particular now given the scenario it becomes extremely crucial for both the retail houses as well as the suppliers to overcome these challenges and tap the vast opportunities and this is exactly where the art of dunhambi's media science come into picture dunhambi's media science propositions rest on four key pillars and starts by capturing the data data the oil to this entire engine right so a customer's interaction with the retailer forms the primary source of this data collection process but sometimes however there also exist dependencies on some of our third party sources also right just give it a thought a customer receives an offer that's a data he clicks on that offer that's a data he comes to the store still and prints offer that's a data he purchases and transacts that's a data so all in all the key lies in assessing every interaction that a customer makes right from showing interest till the final transaction is you know made by him or her now once this data has been captured properly we blended with our sophisticated customer science tools and techniques in order to deliver the best in class solutions for our clients the inherent idea still remains the same something that we discussed right in slide 1 right which is to create a balance between the needs of your customers and of course your retailers and finally come up with solutions that can benefit both the entities 
for example let's talk about you know recommender signs encompassing things like you know have you forgotten you might also like a concept that all of us have already experienced before right just think of your latest e-commerce experience i mean i uh, personally love those experiences when i go to an e-commerce website and i get oh uh, you know people have also purchased this that gives me actually vast variety of uh, options available and sometimes i even tend to purchase those things so if you give it some deeper thoughts you'll realize that the signs not only help these customers save time and effort but also help the retailers engage its customer base in a seamless manner which in return reduces the friction in their shopping experience the dream of every retailer right on the similar note you know we also have concepts like personalized offers that adds that sense of value among the customers i being you know a loyal customer to a certain brand receives that offers that gives me a sense of value my retailer knows me i'm getting value of my purchases that in a way tends to increase that trust and loyalty of mine towards the retailers right now similarly there are also algorithms you know something like the life cycle activation or maybe life cycle marketing that enables these retailers leverage the best of customer satisfaction there by strengthening their long term loyalty in the process right so this in a way sets up the business expectations in total once we are clear with what exactly you know are the business requirements and how are we balancing the needs of our participants it becomes critical to add that touch of personalization like that pinch of salt using the different retail media channels existing out there and to top it up it becomes even more crucial to personalize these strategies based on the life cycle of the customers and i i mean you can also give it a thought right that the strategies and the channels by which they are implemented does not necessarily work for all the life cycle uh, stages alike right for example an offer that might be appealing enough to acquire a new customer base might not work to win back the lapsed customers right similarly you know a channel that might work for an existing loyal base of my customers might not be sufficient enough to reach out to customers who have either lapsed or are engaged with my competitors so it is because of this reason why you know omni channel personalization topped up with customers life cycle forms the crux of a good targeting strategy but again is this enough and the answer is still no any targeting or the strategies implemented are all futile if we do not measure it properly right the evaluations of all the campaigns that imbibes our strategies are not only crucial to demonstrate the impact that our solutions had but also to extract the key insights that can help us refine those processes for future right uh, most of these evolutions uh, 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 that we have seen earlier so mostly with respect to the evaluations of all my campaigns and the major metrics that they contain depend primarily on the objective of the campaigns for example you know a campaign targeted for increasing the revenue of the retailers let's say focuses on metrics such as sales uplift similarly imagine there's a campaign that is rolled out with an objective to increase the footfall of customers that would focus on metrics such as rate of participation rate of redemption maybe rate of activation while on the other hand you know if cost is what concerns us then kpis such as roi return on investment roas return on advertisement spend are the best metrics that can help the retailer assess their business positions sometimes however the objectives beyond these general kpis might also revolve around the dna of the customer for example let's say there's a brand x that wants to acquire mid market customers for its up market product or maybe let's say there's a brand y that wants to convert you know one time shoppers to a frequent buyer and so on and so forth and this is where the measurement through the lens of customer dna comes into picture now once the measurement is done we mark the complete circle to the entire loop of processes however only this time we subsequently achieve the win 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 model a model that brings all the three major participants of this ecosystem in the state of equilibrium where they are now able to attain their objectives in the best possible manner the suppliers or the brands increase their reach and popularity with the customers while simultaneously winning the retailers similarly if you'll talk about the retailers you know they build that long term loyalty among just customers and of course you know revenue uh, through the seamless customer experience and finally you have the customers the kings who develop that feel of value and rewards while of course saving money through the best offers and deals available out there and we the dunhambians sit right at the intersection of all the three major players enabling them achieve their equilibrium in the best possible manner so this in short was the essence of the retail media what exactly it contains under its umbrella and what role 
you know organizations like dunhambi play in leveraging the best out of it however things are not as simple as they look in this deck uh, there are numerous challenges that cripple the decision making processes of the key participants especially if you look at it from the point of view of retailers and your suppliers also right for example for all the economics enthusiasts out there there exists the famous theory of scarcity of resources given by robbins one of the greatest economists of all time hands down that explains how the resources around us are limited in nature right and even our retailers are no exception to this both the retailers and the suppliers face the same issue of ensuring the maximum return out of the limited resources that are available to them and to top it up since you know a uh, scenario it becomes even more complicated with the paradox of choices available around us out of the multiple media channels available the selection and even the rejection of the best channels to serve their objective becomes a huge task for these retail houses and this is exactly where the science of budget optimization come into picture that opens up that path for the best allocation in the limited resources to elaborate more on this we have arya with us so handing it over to you arya Thanks, Rajat. Hello, everyone. Allow me to share my screen. Rajat, if you could help me confirm yes. the truth. Yes, Arya, it's there. Sure. Okay. Uh, thanks, Rajat, uh, and I hope. everyone is enjoying the session so far uh, this was definitely an exciting first half where we got just of how dunambi sets at the center of a win 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 model benefiting the retailers the consumers and the cpgs now let us end it on a note where we talked about paradox of choices that a supplier goes through during campaign planning and the difficulty that comes along in deciding the channels to go ahead with what if there's a way to change the problem statement slightly and instead of making these choices we focus on optimizing these choices this is where we dwell into the world of omni channel campaigns targeting customers to more than one channels simultaneously and then also reporting their impact at a cross channel view that is essentially referred to as an omni channel media proposition now for our use case here we have considered three broad channel categories starting with offsite Offsite refers to social media ads such as the programmatic displays, meta ads, Instagram ads, Pinterest ad, so entire digital ecosystem that Rajat just talked about. Followed by in-store, where the elements can be divided into two broad categories: the aisle elements and the store elements. Aisle elements can be the ones kept on the shelf or acting as banners when you walk into an aisle, whereas the store elements could be radio ads or the digital screens placed at the entrances and the exits of the store. last but not the least we have on site ads which are the ads shown on the retailers websites they again can be classified into two major categories targeted ads so when a customer logs into the website they see the ad that are customized as per their needs and the second category is time based ads which run on the platform for a specific duration and any customer who happens to stumble upon the website may see the ad now we have discussed about what is an omni channel media proposition Let us revisit the need for budget optimization by dwelling into the origin of this problem. So, if in today's digital era, paradox of choices is a legal problem, a natural conclusion from the same is that suppliers have an increasing affinity to influence customers through multiple touch points. So, what they end up doing is spending a large sum of money in planning these omni-channel campaigns, and this is where the problem of budget optimization comes into play. We propose the solution to the problem as allocating budget using linear optimization to yield maximum returns. In technical terms, we define returns as conversions or consumers who are exposed to the ad and also ended up making purchases during the campaign. Now, we coined the term linear optimization. Uh, let's relive our childhood memories from the mathematics class and understand through a very simple example how it works. Here on the screen, we have a very simple equation in two variables with x and y, and two coefficients c1 and c2 for which the values are known. So the goal is to maximize the equation c1x plus c2y. Now, just like in any other real life scenario, here also we are working with a few constraints. Let's just say, for the sake of this example, there are three constraints: x and y collectively cannot exceed two hundred thousand, x individually cannot exceed hundred thousand. And why individually cannot exceed one hundred and fifty thousand? 
Now, when we put these things on the graph, the constraints look something like this. This is the first constraint visualized on the graph, followed by the second constraint, followed by the third constraint, which leads us to the feasible region, or essentially the region which is well within the bounds of constraints and where we have to find the values of x and y, such that when substituted back into the equation, maximizes this equation. And let's just say for the sake of discussion, the point of maxima or the values of x and y for which this equation is maximized lies somewhere here. So this is how we do linear optimization in two dimensions. But let us understand how we have used it in our use case with three different channels. Right. So the goal is to maximize conversions along across the three channels that we discussed, that is off-site, on-site, and in-store. To refresh our memories on conversions, they refer to customers who were exposed to the ad and also ended up making purchases during the campaign window. Now, this is a wholesome equation, so let's not worry about it. We'll break it down one by one. But before I start unpacking this equation, it is important to highlight that what we have shown here is just to give you a flavor of the approach. It does not necessarily depict the exact details of what we have implemented, but nonetheless acts as a good benchmark to implement linear optimization for budget allocation. Coming back to the equation. It is divided into three parts. The leftmost part depicts the in-store conversions for the customers who were converted in in-store, followed by the middle part for on-site conversion and the rightmost part for the off-site conversion. Now, this entire equation is divided into coefficients and variables, just like we saw in the previous example. So variables is some other things that we are already aware about. That is the budget in-store, budget on-site and budget off-site, essentially the budgets that we wish to allocate to the channel. Let's unpack the coefficients. In coefficients, we have average conversion rate and the average cost per exposure by each channel. Now, what is conversion rate? Conversion rate is defined as the converted customers by the exposed customers. Essentially, the pool of customers who ended up making a purchase out of the pool of customers who were exposed to the ad in the respective channels. What is cost per exposure? It is the cost per exposed customers. Essentially, the dollar or the pound amount we spend to reach our customers through these different channels. And finally, the budget is the variable that we wish to allocate to the channel and we wish to determine through the linear optimization. Now, you must have noticed that we are referring to averages of these coefficients and not the absolute numbers. And so let's find out how we, how we arrive at the channel level average. Let's unpack that methodology. Now, here in this example, we are working with a supplier who has given us a particular period in 2023 towards the later half of the year where they want to go live with their product and they want to do campaign with us, which is depicted by the region surrounded by black lines here. They also mentioned that they want to go live with a product that belongs to the fresh food categories. So what we do is we do historical campaign selection. We go back two years. Now you may want to go as many years as you want, but the retail and media is a dynamically changing industry as we just uh, have you just seen in the journey that Rajat depicted. So it's best to keep it relevant. So in this example, we went ahead for 2022 and 2021, and we shortlisted the campaigns belonging to the fresh category that happened in the same period as the supplier wishes to go live. Once that happens, we bucket these campaigns into the three respective channels, which is in-store, on-site, and off-site. Once that happens, things become very simple. We just need to determine the conversion rate and the cost per exposure for each of these campaigns. And then we take the vertical averages of these to get our coefficients. Now, you may already notice that to capture seasonality, we have shortlisted campaigns belonging to the same time of the year as the supplier's planned campaign. And to capture category behavior, we have shortlisted campaigns belonging to the same category as the suppliers. Cool. So now we have unpacked the goal equation, understood the coefficients, and how to calculate them as well. So we started with the origin of the problem. Then we discussed a simple example of linear optimization, followed by how we have utilized the same in our use case. And then lastly, unpacking this wholesome equation. So if now I have to summarize this entire process in a nutshell, it would look something like this. We start by gathering inputs, that is campaign duration, category, total budget that the supplier has sanctioned to us, and the constraints. Briefly talking about constraints here, they could be something like, the minimum budget that we need to go live on a platform, the maximum budget that could be exhausted on a platform depending upon the reach of the platform, or preferences of suppliers, that means how much of the total sanctioned budget they want maximum to be allocated to a channel. So all these factors could also be 
used here as constraints. Once that happens, we do selection of historical campaigns followed by coefficient calculation. We just saw in the previous slides how to do that, followed by linear optimization. So we put all of this to linear optimization. And in the end, we have the recommended budgets for all the channels. Now, we're also excited to share the results of a few tests we did on some of the historical campaigns to see if the methodology may produce incremental conversions. Before I unpack the results, an important disclaimer to note that this is solely based on historical campaigns and we have not yet tested it with the live supplier. But in terms of results, we tested on two campaigns belonging to two different categories. So one of them belonged to the crisps category, which is a snacking category. The other one belonged to a beer, wine, or spirits category. Now, had we gone with the recommended budget split through linear optimization, which is two is to five is to one across the three channels and four is to one is to five across the three channels for these two respective subcategories, we would have gotten approximately 40% incremental conversions. So we saw the results and we can already see that when it comes to prompt budget recommendation and immediate campaign planning, linear optimization is something that can work better than business understanding. But just like any other methodology, it also has limitations. For example, how to optimize budget when data complexity increases with increasing number of channels. Here, we have only considered three channels. Or how to capture seasonality in a more robust manner. Or things like accounting for phenomena like ad stock effect, saturation effect. This is where we need more complex models, such as the market mix model. And to walk us all through the same, I'd invite my peers, Amit and Ankit. Over to you guys. Thank you. So, uh, Arya, can you uh, do one thing before going on? So, like, if my screen is visible and uh, you can hear me loud and clear as well. Everything is perfect. Amit. Good. So, first of all, thank you, Arya, for explaining us the intricacies of media budget optimization that uses the linear programming approach, which is a truly remarkable piece of science. So during our session, Rajat took us through what are the paradox of choices that retailers face in terms of budget. And then Arya explained us how to tackle that problem using the uh, approach of budget optimization. But as we gather more and more data from the past media campaigns and optimize the budget using the linear programming approach, we can move forward towards the more formal market mix models to get a long-term and a more intricate view of how media investments influence the sales. All right, let's now take you through what market mix modeling or MMM is and where it works the best. So MMM is a powerful tool that can help businesses to optimize their marketing effort and drive long-term growth. As we can see on the right side, it shows us the sales decomposition graph, which explain us how each media channel is contributing to the overall sales. In cases where multiple campaigns are running at the same time, MMM provides a unique advantage over other attribution, uh, popular attributed uh, methodologies like last attribution, which as the name suggests, attribute the entire sales just to the last channel which the customer was contacted. But it might lead to a biased measurement. Whereas market mix modeler overcomes this by considering the contribution of each touch point in the whole customer journey, which large touch attribution is unable to do. So businesses can also understand the impact of external factors such as seasonality, competition, and economic condition on their overall sales. Businesses can also use it in the calculation of ad stock and the saturation effect that are influencing their media investments. But we'll get to the details of these terms in the later section. For uh, the summary purpose, all of these can help businesses to adjust their marketing strategies and make more informed decisions. But it's not all sunshine, right? So with the added complexity of the problem, it requires a lot more data too. Let's look at what fuel MMM requires to get its engine running. The first one and the obvious one is the sales data. It will be the foundation of our model. 
So that will be used for measuring the impact of different marketing activities. And it will all, also act as a target variable, which our machine learning model will be regressing. Then comes the data of our uh, various marketing activities that we are trying to analyze. This consists of marketing information, like the cost of advertisement across different channels, number of ad impressions, and etc. But in order to get an accurate and a robust model, we can also use some other data like product prices, customer behavior data, competitor information, to name a few. So if this variety of data is available to us, only then we can truly harness the power of market mix modeling. Now let's move towards what the overall process of market mix modeling looks like. Looking at the process overview, it seems pretty easy, right? Just from one to five. No, nah, not quite. So first, once we have our media channel data ready with us, that the prerequisite of the model, we can move towards the feature selection that uh, for what's relevant to us. Second one, for the selection of features, we'll be using a formal causal framework or causality. Third one, after getting the right relevant features, we can proceed with our modeling using machine learning models. Oh, all right, we are halfway through our journey. Let's focus. Fourth one, now that we have our model ready with us, all pumped up with rigorous training, we'll be using our model to get the carryover and the ad stock values from it, which are a pretty useful metric to design a successful marketing campaign. Final, finally, that uh, we'll try to understand how well our marketing activities worked, and we'll be also looking at the channel-wise contribution and try to understand their behavior using the concept of sharp values. But let's hold on. Let's just first reiterate the process. There are a bunch of terms that were new to me and might be new to some of you, like causality, carryover, ad stock, and sharp. You heard it before, you heard it again. Don't worry, we get plenty of time and we'll be explaining all those terms to you in the further slides. Let's move towards the identification and selection of relevant features. For that, we'll be using causal inference or causality to help us understand. As we know, feature selection is an important step in any data-driven uh, decision-making process. As without the set of right variables, no algorithm can give you right predictions, accurate predictions. So traditionally in regression feature selection strategies, looking at the correlations between the variable of interest was quite popular. But correlation does not imply causation as we cannot legitimately deduce a cause and effect relation between the two events or variables solely on the basis of an observed association or correlation between them. That's an issue. So one way to overcome this fallacy is to approach the feature selection process through the lens of causality, where we aim to identify the variables that have a causal effect on the outcome of interest. In our case, it's the sales. Let's understand causality with the help of a causal diagram. But first, let's understand what causal diagram or causal model is. So in science, a causal model is a conceptual model that describes a causal mechanism of a system. So these model assumes that the change in one variable can cause change in another variable. And the aim is to identify the direction and the magnitude of the causal effect. In our case, a causal diagram is a directed graph that displays the causal relationship between the variables. Firstly, we'll be placing our target variable, that is sales. And then we place our variable of interest, which is advertisement spend. As we apply our business sense, we know that the advertisement spend would be positively correlated with the sales. So if there is more advertisement spend, the sales should also increase. But there might be other factors that are also influencing sales. Let's understand with it uh, with an example. So like near Valentine's Day, the sales of chocolate will naturally increase. But if there is a marketing campaign going around that time, we might incorrectly attribute the increase in sales just entirely due to that marketing activity. 
but in actuality the seasonality of valentines day would also play a role in increase in sales of chocolate so this is where causality comes to the rescue so using a formal causal framework we can visualize and cause an effect relationship between features and the target variable in this basic example we are just adding uh, factors such as seasonality and competitor promotions which are the uh, control variables that would ensure that we can capture a more accurate effect of advertisement spend on sale but causality isn't just as simple as i explained there is a lot more complexity in the real world and that is beyond the scope of this session now that we have discussed the importance of feature selection and identify the most relevant features for our analysis we can move towards the phase that is modeling with the variables that we have selected we can build a model that can accurately predict the outcomes that we are interested in such as sales or revenue but which techniques to use to fill our model it's the paradox of choice for us all over again will it be the statistical technique machine learning techniques time series algorithms as we know machine learning algorithms provides a greater flexibility and capability to capture complex relationship in the data as compared to the statistical algorithms but if we go with the machine learning algorithm then which one for this talk we can go with the simplest machine learning algorithm that is the random forest so taking a random forest model and we have fitted it on the synthetic data and as you can see on the right side we have our model predictions with us that is the model output it represents the sales with respect to the days so whereas the line plot on the blue is showing as the predicted value and the scatter plot on the red is showing as the actual or the true value as you can see our model is able to explain the various on our target variable that is sales next we'll be discussing other key insights from our model for that i'll be passing on the torch to ankit who will explain you to the rest of the interesting uh, terminologies like ad stock and carry over effects and how to explain our random forest model that we just fitted using the concept of tap values and there are a lot more interesting things to talk about over to you ankit Okay. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Just confirm if I'm audible. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ahmed, for that wonderful introduction to market mix modeling and introducing the methodology as well that we're going to be using. All right. So now that we have fitted our sales, promotions, and control features data to the random forest model, we'll start extracting some juicy insights from it. The first one on our list is very interesting. So when we make an advertising effort. we don't see its results immediate right so an advertising effort takes time to wear in and its effect doesn't last forever either it peters off after some time this is called the ad stock or the carry over effect we have a graph in front of us right here on the y axis you'll see the advertising effect of any if effort that we make It goes right up from 100% to down to the rock bottom on the 0% on the x axis we have time ticking on by for the purposes of this example we'll use three media channels we have social media ads so these are the ads that you see on your instagram feeds linkedin feeds wherever you're doom scrolling you also have tv ads so ads that you see on your big screen on your living room and you have coupon ad tell so these are the coupons that you receive when you pay your bill in a physical store at the tell what we observe here is that social media ads their impact peters off very quickly right it doesn't retain its impact for quite uh, for very long now this may, may be explained away by the sheer amount of content you have on your social media feeds right you're quickly scrolling through so once you see an ad the next time you see it its effect is very minimal on the other hand you see tv ads in the green line here they retain their impact for quite some time well this might just be because you have to sit through the entire ad and you can't just press the skip button there However, coupon at till the third channel lies somewhere down in the middle. Now, we do not want the ad effect of any of these channels to reach the rock bottom at any point. This ad stock information, the one right in front of us, helps us decide when to pump more resources into advertising to maintain the impact. Now, 
to extract a bit more mileage out of the random forest wagon we are on, we're going to use a very interesting tool called SHAP. SHAP, standing for Shapely Additive Explanations, builds upon the concept of Shapely values, and its theory is steeped deep into cooperative games. Whatever players there are in the game, it tries to assign them unequal contrib contribution values based on the contributions that they make to the actual results. So what happens here is that each coalition or combination of input variables is taken. It's combined with the weights and predictions of the model that we have trained and is used to fit an optimized linear model. This additive linear model will be our explainer model for the rest of the example. In a gist, what we're doing is we're explaining away a black box model, in this case, a simpler random forest model with an even simple linear attribution model, a linear model, the coefficients of which we'll be using as the contributions for our different channels, for our sales variables that we have right here. Now, next up, we'll use these SHAP explained values to gain two very important insights about our advertising investments. First, We'll break down our sales across the data set into a base component. So if we can move on to the next slide, Amit. All right, thank you. So first up, we'll break down our sales across the data set into a base component. So the large contribution value that you see at the bottom of the graph right there, that's the base sales. On the X axis, you have time ticking on by, and on the Y axis, we have our target variable, that is the sales. And the base contribution is the contribution that would have happened anyways, even if we hadn't run any advertisements at all. And on top of that, you'll see contributions from individual channels. So still the same three channels that we were talking about earlier on the earlier slide. Now, from here on out, we can see very many insights into what's happening, right? For example, we'll be able to see spikes wherever we are running promotions. We'll see drops in the channel contributions where our competitors are running promotions. We can identify gaps in our advertising wherever contributions go down to zero and so on. Now, another super duper important thing to know about is the saturation effect. What's saturation effect? Well, in an ideal world, if I'm an advertiser, what I would expect is that I keep pumping in more money into my advertising channel and my returns just keep shooting up and up, right? Well. Fortunately or unfortunately for us, that is not the case. At some point, after a certain level of spending, what we start to see is a diminishing return along with increasing advertising spend. That is what we see right here. So three graphs in front of us. On the x-axis, we have daily ad spending. So how much am I spending daily on each of these channels? And on the y-axis, we have returns from each of these channels respectively. Let's go through them one by one. On the leftmost, leftmost side, we have social media ads. Now, what we observe here is that we get very minimal returns from this channel until a certain threshold, right? So the graph is flat for quite some time before picking up. This is a positive threshold. What it means is that until a certain point, right? Until a certain level of daily spending, my ads that I'm running on your Instagram feeds, on your Facebook feeds are just getting lost in all of that chap that is present at that level. Only when I increase the number of ads, do you st even start paying attention to those? So that's why we see limited returns until a threshold daily spend. On the other, on the other hand, the TV ads channel is growing linearly right now, right? So here I can expect to increase my daily spending and still get proportionately increased returns out of it. This channel hasn't saturated yet but it does not mean that it will never saturate in the future. Eventually, if I keep increasing my daily spending on this channel, it will begin to look like the rightmost graph on our screens. This channel, coupon at till, has saturated. What it means is that at the later part of the graph, even though we keep increasing the daily ad spending, the returns are not increasing really that much, right? So this is our first saturated channel. In fact, the optimal, optimal case spending, daily spending for this channel lies somewhere in the middle of the graph and not to the right most. All right. Well, now that we know what the optimal spend for every channel is, we have seen and investigated when and what causes channel contributions to hike and dive through the contributions breakdown. 
and from the carryover graphs, we know how long each of the channels carry over their impacts for. It's time to mix every ingredient into the cauldron and mix it well. Because next up, we're going to use all of them to optimize and allocate our budget across channels. Amit, can we go to the next slide? Yes, thank you. All right. So we take optimized daily spending from saturation curves that we saw just a bit ago. We compensate for when we see a dip in contributions from the channel-wise breakdowns. And we decide on the type of advertising strategy. So drip, pearls, burst, all these type of advertising strategies based on the carryover effect that we saw a while ago. For an added bonus, we can also make use of the interaction effect between channels as well. Doing this leads to a better strategy for dynamic budget allocation across channels over time giving off better results on every buck spent on advertising. All right. In conclusion, concluding the presentation here, in conclusion, uh, Amit, can you move on to the next slide, please? Rajat started off with the in and outs of retail media landscape, how it has evolved with time, and what challenges as well as vast opportunities lie ahead. More importantly, how Dunham Beast Media Science helped drives a win-win-win scenario for customers, suppliers, and retailers. Next, Arya took a step even further and talked about how media budget allocation helps a company select media channels to reach their customers effectively. This type of budget optimization can open doors towards prompt budget recommendations despite limited resources. And finally, Amit and I spoke on how with the ever-increasing complexity of the retail landscape, its media channels, and with the availability of long-term data, Market mix modeling utilizing techniques such as causal analysis and SHAP can help draw much deeper insights across the entire process, enabling companies to better measure, allocate, and utilize their investments on retail media. Well, this brings us to the end of our short hike through the woods of retail media and Dunhumbi's media science. I hope all of you got to learn something informative and have something to think about the next time you get an SMS for 10% off of your favorite can of baked beans.